Thank you all for coming. Uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about some uh, work that we've been doing in China. Uh, my name is uh, Wade Schultz, in case you didn't see me uh, yesterday. And I'm a resident physician at the Yale School of Medicine, as well as our senior solution architect for the Yale New Haven Health System. Uh, unfortunately, Dai Hao, uh, my collaborator over in China, was unable to make it due to some funding stuff he had to stay there to uh, work on uh, this week. Uh, but one of our other collaborators, Zhu, is here in the second row. So if anyone has any questions after, feel free to come up and ask either one of us. And uh, the study that we started doing in Beijing uh, actually started many, many years ago with one of my other collaborators at Yale, Harlan Krumholz, who is a cardiologist. And over the last year, we've really started to increase the amount of data that we've been collecting for the portion of this trial. Uh, so between this uh, collaboration, it's not a formal collaboration between our universities, but uh, Yale New Haven Health, uh, several of our labs do have ongoing collaborations in Beijing, as well as the Yale Center uh, Beijing, uh, located in downtown uh, near the embassy area as well. So the group that we primarily work with in Beijing is uh, the National Center for Cardiovascular Diseases, which is paired with Fuwai Hospital, one of the leading cardiovascular centers really in the world. And this is, also contains a state key laboratory, as well as a national clinical research center and a very large biobank. Uh, and down on the bottom is just the uh, picture of all of the buildings just outside the fifth ring, uh, ring in Beijing. And just as a little bit more background, uh, the biggest piece of this entire facility is really one of our biobanks, which has 10 million biospecimens at this point, including cardiac tissue, DNA, RNA, serum, plasma, urine, and saliva. And unlike a lot of the issues we have with biobanks in the US, we actually end up testing a large number of these specimens in China. So these aren't simply going into a freezer and sitting forever and never being touched. A lot of these have already had follow-up testing done, whether that be specific chemistry analytes, uh, further tissue diagnostics, or DNA RNA isolation for follow-up sequencing. And the main focus in terms of research, uh, which you could probably guess from the name, is cardiovascular disease. So I'm actually a clinical pathologist. My main focus is on laboratory testing, DNA sequencing. Uh, but the China Peace Millions Persons program is really focused on trying to deliver better cardiovascular care, better cardiovascular screening, not just in the larger areas of uh, China, Beijing, Shanghai, and so on, but really trying to get more public health out into the rural communities as well. So trying to deliver things like uh, blood pressure screening, looking for high blood pressure or high lipids, and making sure that people in really across the country can get health care delivered as they need to. When this started, it uh, had a goal enrollment of 2 million people, which we enrolled back in 2016. And because of the success of this project, it's now been increased to increase that screening up to 5 million people by 2020. So when we talk precision medicine in the US, uh, the recent All of Us initiative, the goal is to enroll 1 million people over five years. With the project here at, in Beijing, we've already enrolled 2 million and are moving up to 5 million over the next three years. The organizational structure of this really is spread across China. So it has 31 different provinces uh, that are helping collect data, 469 hospitals, and 7,674 primary care institutions. And as you can see, this is really spread all the way around the country and much larger uh, than what it looks like uh, on my slide here. So moving on from kind of the background and what's happening at the center really into what we're dealing with on the data side and really why probably many of you are here is looking at the different types of data that we collect for the China Peace and Million Persons Project. And this ranges from demographic information to imaging data, electrocardia electrocardiograms, uh, echocardiograms, chest x-rays, scanned laboratory tests. We also get some of those digitally and electronically, medical notes, prescriptions. So really a wealth of data really spanning the spectrum of medical care. Some of it's electronic, some of it's unstructured in images, so it presents you know, a lot of unique challenges in terms of how we manage that data, store it, and when we move from going and saying, well, we've got the data, now how can we actually do something in terms of analysis? Because nobody wants to go through and read five million scanned lab tests, so how can we get that into a format that we can use? And now within the last year, we've started to move into a lot more uh, genomics as well. Uh, so we have a goal of getting approximately 30, uh, I believe it's 30,000 total, starting with 10,000 whole exome sequences, as well as uh, 2 million chip genotypes afterwards, and trying to do genome imputation basically to figure out the genetic diversity of China, and then identifying rare variants that may impact either cardiac prognosis or your therapy response to different cardiovascular medications. 
So when we look at some of the unique challenges that we ran into in China, the first one is definitely looking at internet connectivity. Uh, when we look at many of those rural provinces, when we, what actually ends up happening is people will go out to the rural provinces or they will use primary care providers uh, at the local clinics to collect a very detailed questionnaire uh, that's done electronically. Uh, part of that software was written by Zhu's group, uh, some of by other consultants. But these very detailed questionnaires are collected and we need to figure out some way to efficiently get them back to the center. Internet may not always be available, may not always be very high speed, so there's actually a fairly elaborate system set up that initially was built on Storm to transfer all of that data from those remote provinces into the central location. For some of our other data, we actually do the moving the hard drive. So <laughs> as uh, you know, we actually do this in the US too. So when we start talking large genomic data, it's still very common even here to move that by portable hard drive. Uh, but given the number of hard drives that we're dealing with, and this isn't just for genomics in China, but for our electrocardiograms and our echoes, our, a lot of our imaging studies, that gets transferred by drive as well. All of these are encrypted, but maintaining the supply chain or the, you know, tracking where these drives are. So as we get them back from the facilities, are they in transit? Are they lost in transit? Did they actually get shipped? Becomes a little bit of a burden, as well as once they show up, making sure that we have a good process in place for managing that data and getting it transferred transferred from those drives into a system somebody can use so that it just doesn't sit in somebody's desk drawer for the next five years. And then the last thing is integrating you know, the traditional data warehouses. So all of the information that does get transferred from the questionnaires, from those local drives, a portion of that goes into an Oracle data warehouse right now. And trying to figure out as we move into more unstructured data types, the imaging and the genomics, how can we pull in that questionnaire data and create a single data lake so that we can do studies across all of our data sources? So this gets us into a few of the research problems that we are trying to solve with our Hadoop installation in Beijing. Uh, one of them is data quality monitoring, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about each of these, but you know, trying to identify entry errors, acquisition bias, so finding out if interviewers may not be asking all of the questions or are not typing in all of the answers correctly. Uh, trying to do some advanced analytics, so trying to really move beyond, if anyone heard my uh, talk yesterday, moving beyond the single diagnosis into something that's a little bit more complex and figuring out, can we predict risk better than just saying hypertension? And then the last thing that we are interested in is kind of expanding that and not just using clustering, but some outlier and anomaly detection as well. The Hadoop infrastructure that we put into place to manage this, uh, this might be a little bit small to read, but I can walk you through it. So we've got an admi administrative node uh, that's running on a virtual machine that manages Mbari and many of our other administrative services. We've got our standard name node, failover node, master nodes uh, down on the bottom left. Uh, we also have three edge nodes that we use for data ingest as well as our entry point for anybody coming in to do analysis in the cluster. And uh, we're now up to, I believe, uh, eight of the data nodes down in the bottom right. Overall, this comes out now, I think it's actually uh, about twice that with our additional data nodes, some, somewhere between uh, two and four terabytes of total memory and uh, 390 and 500 or so cores of processing on these nodes. So moving over from the infrastructure, what do we pick for tooling? So now that we've got our hardware there, we've got all of our data, how do we pick out of the, you know, something that people have probably seen, the big data landscape of 2016? None of us are probably gonna wanna learn all of these. How can we get down to a reasonable set of tools that we can teach to others within the organization and between organizations to really move into a core set of a data science toolkit? And really when I start planning any workflow for a data science project, I usually try to split it up into the different key areas of the data management life cycle. So we're gonna have to ingest some data, process it, store it, and then do some analysis at the end. And rather than using the really big screen of you know, hundreds and hundreds of tools, I try to drop this down, and this is kind of the core set of uh, tools that I end up using, but this varies for you know, every data scientist, every developer out there. For ingest, uh, we rely heavily on uh, Scoop, Kafka, we do some uh, NiFi and HDF as well, uh, Storm and Spark for our data processing. Storage, we rely heavily on HDFS. Uh, we're starting to do a little bit of work with HBase, particularly for doing some of our master patient indexes, so tracking different IDs across different studies. And then Elastic and, Elas and Kibana for some of our uh, storage and real-time visualizations. From the analysis perspective, definitely heavily reliant on Spark and Zeppelin. And then we do a decent amount of work with Python for some of our machine learning, and I'll get to that in more detail later on. 
Uh, this is just another figure kind of looking at the same thing, but one piece I wanted to highlight is we also do do a lot of work with uh, Docker and microservices. So for a lot of our data ingest pipelines that are, if they're written in Python, some of our analytic pipelines, those actually get put in Docker containers run it rather than running directly on the hardware or on the server itself. Makes it easy to deploy, easy to scale, and easy to replicate between uh, dev and production environments. So if we look at the pipeline that we end actually ended up implementing and using, uh, this is kind of trying to represent all of our different data sources, so our traditional data warehouse up on the top left. Most of that data is being moved in by Scoop right now into HDFS on a schedule. All of our EKG data, our imaging data, uh, genomic data that comes into the center, that's all getting processed with Python into HDFS. And then we do most of our analytics again with Spark and push some of that with Spark out to Elasticsearch for visualizations. We also have a biobank. Trying to manage all of those specimens can be quite a difficult task. Again, we've got 10 million already with only 2 million patients enrolled. And a lot of that data kind of starts to get disjointed. So as patients have specimens collected, they're assigned a specimen ID number. Those are put into the survey software and into the traditional data warehouse. Once the box gets to the center, we scan the box and put it in the freezer, but there's not necessarily a lot of verification to make sure samples are there, how much specimen is left, and so on. So after we actually receive them, uh, we're now just developing, we're about halfway done with our biobank uh, platform, which is based off of a combination, again, of Oracle and uh, Hadoop. But as those specimens get updated, as samples get used, and as we start to move more into genomics, we have a very tight connection between our biobank repository and all of those other data uh, within our data in, in our data lake. So moving into some of those questions, so how can we now move beyond just the data acquisition and start getting into some projects? So the first one that I wanted to walk through is data quality monitoring and how we're starting to do that with Zeppelin. I'm not going to be showing you a ton of actual real data here because I always hesitate to try to de-identify everything correctly, so I'm just going to be using some sample data that's been generated. Uh, but we'll try to get the point across, and if anyone has any questions or wants to see more detail, definitely feel free to get in contact with me afterwards. So for the data quality perspective, you know, the big things that we wanted to look at first is trying to identify data entry errors. We do try to pick some of these up, so if somebody a normal range for a systolic blood pressure, you know, the top number of the blood pressure is usually between, you know, should be between 190 and 120, 130. Um, physiologic is probably about 200, you can get a little bit higher, but if someone entered 400 for a systolic blood pressure, way too high, we should see that as an error. If they say that somebody is, and my metric conversions are terrible, so I'm gonna stick in, our, in US units for now, but if they said someone was 10 feet tall, again, probably an error, so how can we screen for those? But the other thing that we run into is inconsistencies in data capture. So again, trying to identify if we ask for a list of medications and we see that one interviewer is always only listing zero or one meds while the population norm is really three or four, maybe we've got some investigator acquisition bias going on in the study. And just to illustrate that, here are a couple of tables. Again, this is just fake data. But if we look at the top table being interviewer one and the bottom table being interviewer two, you can see that up on top, not that many meds, not that many history items being taken. All of the blood pressures are basically the same. And if you look at the bottom table, there's far more meds and history. There's one patient who doesn't have any, but they're 25, so probably pretty healthy. So we're actually starting to now put this into Zeppelin interfaces. And again, this is just kind of fake data, but we can actually start to do averages on how many meds per day or per interviewer are actually being obtained uh, with any within any particular uh, province or location, and this has helped us already identify a couple of errors, do retraining, and really improve the amount and quality of data that's coming back into the system. The next thing, again, this is a figure that I had used yesterday as well, but trying to do cohort clustering. So now trying to move beyond just data quality, but how can we do some analytics on these populations? And cardiovascular disease is one that we've been doing research in for many, many years. So we know a lot of the risk factors. There's a lot of very large studies. We know that hypertension is bad. We know that high cholesterol is bad. Uh, eggs, we don't know. That could go either way. But cholesterol and blood pressure, definitely bad. Uh, so since we know all of this, how can we really take this to the next step? Uh, so moving beyond those single diagnoses, trying to put these patients into more complex groups so that we can deliver better care earlier on in the treatment cycle. And uh, this is actually data done by one of our MD-PhD students at Yale, uh, uh, George Linderman, and trying to take a number of different variables, so cholesterol, age, weight, 
heart rate height. I think he has a couple of others that use a number of others as well. Uh, you can see on the bottom there's some more included, so uh, triglycerides and some other subdivisions of the other labs. But by doing this, we can actually create different clusters and try to identify patients who may be higher risk. So not just hypertension, but maybe if your blood pressure is 150, but your LDL is only 120, maybe it's not so bad as if those were inverted. So really trying to dig in and find better ways to categorize or group our patients and provide better care. One thing that we run into, which everyone else does as well, is issues with data extraction and feature engineering. So dirty data, never going to end up with good models or good data science coming out the other direction. Again, like I mentioned yesterday, 80% of our medical information is unstructured, so we can lose a lot of information if we don't have that represented appropriately. And as one of the other speakers said yesterday, you know, even our structured field, something like gender, could be empty a large percentage of the time. You might be able to engineer that feature out of other information, but in general, healthcare data is not really all that well maintained, even though it should be. So as we're looking at trying to do a lot of these advanced analytics, the advanced clustering, the outlier detection, uh, we're starting to now move into how else can we try to enhance our data set. So rather than just trying to take uh, physician interpretation of an echocardiogram, an ultrasound of the heart, how can we try to do that more objectively and move out of that entirely subjective realm? And we've started to work on these a uh, couple of different use cases. The one that I really wanted to point out is uh, image recognition and segmentation. And the segmentation piece, while basic, is very important. And we've actually been starting to implement a couple of Facebook libraries, DeepMask and SharpMask, to do medical-based image segmentation. So given a picture of you know, maybe a chest x-ray, we're actually having pretty good luck of using something like DeepMask and SharpMask to identify and isolate the lungs or the heart or certain chambers of the heart. So using these pre-trained models, you can actually do something that you wouldn't necessarily expect with a relatively small training size. Uh, some of the other studies that we've done trying to do the segmentation, we get intersection over unions of about 96 to 98 percent sometimes uh, with only really about 500 images as a training set. The other thing that we're starting to work on is digital signal processing. So electrocardiograms, the little blips of the heart that you can see and do on your phones now. We're trying to do, move from all of that raw data, capture it higher frequency, and do a little bit more detailed analysis. But to do that, we really need to clean up those signals and again, parse them out. So as we're doing the study, people are supposed to capture three minute, 12 lead EKGs, but sometimes they do 30 seconds, sometimes it's two minutes and 15 seconds, sometimes the leads are in the wrong place, so the waveforms are actually inverted. So we have to do a decent amount of cleaning up to actually get results out of that data set. And then the last one is text extraction and optical character recognition. And if anyone's had good luck on this with both English and Chinese characters, let me know, because that's one problem that we run into right now is trying to get through lab results and other reports that may be scanned in or PDFs and trying to extract that data has def really been a challenge that we have not found a great solution for yet. I forgot to click through, but uh, so this is just an example of an echocardiogram, ultrasound of the heart, uh, where we're trying to go through and figure out what are different flow rates, uh, how big are different areas of the heart. Uh, the next one is just looking at our moving from our raw ECG data to the processed. And then the last thing that we needed to do is, as we're doing more of the image analysis, trying to add on the extra computational capacity to deal with that. So we had our basic cluster, which works very well for most of our data loads, but imaging processing is definitely a blocker to some of that, since we need a little bit more GPU support. So we ha actually have added on now uh, one interactive or machine learning node that has two Tesla K80s in it. And we've actually got that integrated into the cluster. Uh, we actually run most of our cluster on CentOS, that node is on Ubuntu, but we actually had a very easy deployment time with the HDP Hortonworks to, to get that deployed among all of that cluster and really make everything run on both sides very well. So the last thing that I wanted to walk through as I uh, kind of try to wrap up the presentation here at the end is trying to scale this now to managing and dealing with genomic data. And I'm just gonna go through a little bit of backgrounds on genomics uh, just so that uh, I can feel like I'm doing a doctorly duty here. But uh, we move from, when we're looking at what we do for sequencing, what we really go through is usually collect blood or tissue, isolate the cells, and get the DNA out of the nucleus. In the nucleus, you'll have uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes, uh, one from mom, one from dad. And if you look at each of those chromosomes, you'll have a double-stranded piece of DNA, and each of the different colors are your standard Gattaca, so the GATs and Cs of the DNA. When we look at sequencing, there's a number of different technologies that we can use, and these have all been around for different periods of time. 
Uh, PCR over on the far left is the way that we uh, amplify DNA, so take small amounts of DNA and make more. And we can also use this for variant detection. So if you're looking at trying to find a single variant or variants in single genes, you can do PCR or multiplex PCR very cheaply, very quickly. But the downside is only a couple of variants. The next one that we do is uh, the sequencing, full gene sequencing and fragment length. So if you're looking at trying to find all of the variants in a gene or in large sets of a gene, that's the technology you would use. The next step up, which you guys are probably familiar with, although you might not know it, is the genotyping array. That's what's done by the 23andMe's of the world. So take a little bit of the DNA, put it on, and you can get a broad number of variants across the genome. So somewhere between usually 600,000 and a couple million variants. You can't really look at full genes very well, but you get a nice overview of the entire genome. And then the last one is next generation sequencing. And these are the new technologies that came out. So the ion torrents, the aluminas, uh, those are the platforms that we use to do larger scale. If you're looking at anything over about 20 genes, next generation sequencing, it starts to become cost effective. And that's how we do whole exomes and whole genomes. When we look at converting bases to bytes, so how much storage, how much space are we talking about? We always complain about it being big. Here's about what comes out in terms of sizes. So on those 23 chromosomes, we've got about 22,000 genes and about 3.3 billion bases or gene pairs. If you look at what's the raw storage you would need to save that information, you could do that with two bits per base, so about 825 megabytes per sequence. That's not so bad. However, when we actually do the sequencing, we also have to store a lot of metadata about those sequences. So what is our certainty of any particular call from the sequencer being right? Uh, what's the quality? Where is it aligned to in the whole genome? And when we store all of that metadata, our whole genome is actually about 150 gigabytes, so much larger storage. So each sample generates 150 gigabytes. If we're talking about tumors and oncology, usually we'll sequence the tumor and the human, so then we're talking about 300 gigs per specimen pair. So we start to build up very quickly, especially if you start saying that we're going to do 30,000, 60,000 of these patients over the next few years. To manage this data, uh, we're just starting to implement this workflow now. So uh, right before this one, we actually just started loading our newest hard drive into our cluster. But as, uh, after we get the sequencing done, the hard drives comes across. We've got a Python script that works on loading that into uh, Kafka, NiFi to HDFS. And I'm actually headed back over to Beijing next Wednesday, and we're going to be starting to deploy our high-performance cluster that does a lot of the genetic steps that aren't really handled very well by Hadoop or by Spark. So after you get the sequence off the sequencer, we have to figure out where it belongs. That's all done by HPC, so we're actually going to be integrating that very closely into our cluster, so trying to do some work with HDFS and NFS gateways to make that data directly accessible to high-performance compute. After those variants are aligned and called, all of the then analyzed data will come back across to NiFi and be put back into the cluster for downstream analysis. So we're very excited. We've started to do a little bit of this at uh, Yale and have been talking to Hortonworks about some other areas where we could expand into, but definitely something of extreme interest in a lot of different healthcare organizations is how can we get this genomic data in there, scale it, and do all of our downstream data analysis. So the last thing that I wanted to go through then is data accessibility and governance. Definitely an issue. I touched on this a little bit yesterday, but something that's very important and we work through a lot of issues with. Uh, not necessarily issues, but takes more time to implement appropriately. So right now, all of our data governance uh, over in China is managed by an in-house application that we call Librarian. Uh, we're definitely always evaluating whether we should move back over to Atlas and probably will at some point in the near future. Other things that we've done is try to enable data access to our statisticians through the tools that they're frequently using or used to. So trying to move some of our traditional statisticians from SAS or R over to Python or Spark is uh, definitely a little bit of a challenge. So we've been working on figuring out how to best enable R and R server to integrate with the Hadoop cluster, and then assessing whether we need to and how to efficiently integrate SAS. Uh, We've tried a couple of things and just aren't getting the performance or the integration that we really wanted. So SAS is not enabled right now, but R and uh, Zeppelin, we do have both up and running. So the next steps is really then trying to move this out for enhancing population scale research. So instead of just the data load or how do we look at individual data collection and quality issues, trying to move and provide more value back to the institution. And one of the big ones is through that biospecimen and biobank software. So not only which specimens do we have, but as we start pulling in our genomic data and finding different variants, 
do we have additional specimens that are likely to have that variant? Can we find specific samples that might be helpful for drug discovery? So trying to provide a very good interface where once we have some additional biologic information about the specimens, being able to go back, track them, and find additional data that uh, would also be relevant. And then the last one is trying to create our feature engineering pipelines in real time. So right now, as images come in, as sequencing comes in, we kind of run it in batch. But one big goal is that as those come in, we can really automate that plus process. So plug in the hard drive, it can copy it over to our cluster, and all of your downstream feature engineering can automatically queue off with either a NiFi call, Spark, or so on. So in summary, and I'll hopefully have a decent amount of time here for uh, questions at the end, uh, but these big data platforms are definitely very exciting for a lot of areas of healthcare and biomedical research. So both in the clinical setting, basic research, translational research, they're becoming a lot more common. It's tough to find large academic centers now that aren't starting to use these platforms. It can be a challenge to secure them appropriately and find resources, but definitely worth it and uh, you know, try to power through any problems that might come up. One thing that I do want to highlight, though, is that while these workflows can be complex, so you might have Kafka, Storm, HDF, Spark, and a lot of different pieces, once you get one pipeline well implemented, the architectures are very reusable. Uh, so the workflows, uh, the architecture diagrams I showed yesterday, I have a lot of them up on my website if anyone wanted to see them in more detail. You'll see very repeatable patterns. So our ingest, really, again, one or two tools for pretty much every data set. The management or data flow, again, one or two tools. So once you become familiar with them, the complexity really starts to decrease. And the continued improvements that we've seen in the Hadoop platform, both for our work in China as well as at Yale, has really increased our, the data accessibility and ease of deployment. So I even remember going from the first installation we did, I think, of like HDP 2.2 to 2.4. Every time I do it, it becomes so much easier. Uh, the upgrade process was fairly painless. I did that about two weeks ago in an afternoon by myself. So, you know, really these platforms and tools are becoming much more manageable to work with. Even, with, even if you don't necessarily have a ton of experience uh, using them in the past. So take advantage when you can, and by trying to pick these right technologies and coupling them with the right data, we definitely have ways to improve healthcare as well as you know, our outcomes and efficiency in many other industries as well. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Otherwise, like I said, uh, Zhu is here as well if anybody uh, has any questions for him. I think privacy and uh, regulation in US, especially HIPAA, as with uh, healthcare records and so on, how much of that is influencing your research? Does it have any impact on how far you can go? You talked about combining maybe biobank data with some genomics data, correlating this data. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I would like you to address the privacy aspect of how that's being handled in this process. Yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of different pieces to privacy. So one of it is the regulation and the legal. Uh, one of it is how you consent patients. So, you know, there's definitely the regulation for HIPAA and so on in the US that requires us to make sure our data is encrypted, make sure that we audit and that we have access permissions. We do manage all of that technically with all of these platforms. So from the technical perspective, there are things you need to do, but none of it's a problem. When you start getting into privacy and the ethic aspect of it, that's a completely different area. So, you know, all of our patients are consented. We go through a very detailed consent process for research. Uh, the stuff that I presented here for China, all of these are enrolled as part of a research trial. So they are given some of the health aspect of it, but these are primarily research questionnaires and research specimens. At Yale, the stuff that I had presented yesterday, much of that is clinical data. So patients are consented when they come in as part of a blanket consent. We don't typically do things like DNA sequencing on them because of the privacy and ethical aspects, so that's a separate consent process. Uh, so there's a lot of different layers. Uh, once you move into the actual analytics, what can you combine and what can you do, that's largely left up to our institutional review boards. So once you've gotten consent, or you know, as you design your study, you have to go to one of these boards and present what's your research plan, how are you going to secure your data, what is your analysis going to be, and who can see it. So really that's up to the institutional review boards to go through that and make sure all of those pieces are in place, and that's what kind of sets the limits of which data you can access and what you can integrate. I think we got a microphone, so it'll come around. Hi, uh, outstanding talk. I just have two questions. Uh, one is, can you expand a little bit on how you, uh, you apply the machine learning, if any, uh, in this study? And 
then the assuming you know you may using the MLLib type of things or are you ever considering like a deep learning type of things? Yes. And my second Sorry. question, let me just finish yep. it. And the second question is that you mentioned the Zeppelin as a notebook. I just wonder why you select the Zeppelin as a choice instead of like a more popular notebook like a Jupyter. Yeah, so uh, I'll answer the second one first because it's probably a little bit quicker to get to. So I love Jupyter. I use it a lot. We actually use it over here too, but the reason we end up using Zeppelin is partly because of the Kerberos and Spark aspect. So I know there was a talk yesterday by Bloomberg about trying to get Kerberos and everything working in Jupyter, and it can technically be done, but it is a lot of steps and a lot of extra stuff to work in that you end up potentially maintaining yourself. If anyone has a good solution, let me know. Where Zeppelin, very easy to pull up as part of the whole Hadoop package for HTTP. Install it, it's automatically, basic, you know, not automatically, but Kerberos enabled, you've got direct access to Spark, so just was an easier deployment for those types of analyses. But for a lot of our straight Python work, we do do that in Jupyter. In terms of the machine learning, uh, we're just starting to do that in China. Uh, so we've just gotten really all of our data moved across and the couple examples I showed, uh, the clustering, those we're actually starting to do there now. So depending on where you start to define machine learning, if you're okay with calling logistic regression or going further down the line, but we are working on some of that actively. For more of the deep learning convolutional neural nets, we do do a lot for our image processing, so we are using those. Uh, we use a lot of Keras. Uh, one of our uh, research scientists is actually a core contributor for lasagna, so we use that a decent amount just because he actually develops the upstream code for it. Uh, a lot of diversity in packages, we kind of bounce back and forth as we evaluate and try to find good ones. The only one we haven't really used a lot actually is TensorFlow. Uh, we'll probably start examining it a little bit more again, but we've just never really gone that route a lot. Thank you. So um, I have a question in terms of general applicability of this kind of technology and framework or mm -hmm. solution to common people. So when do you see this kind of framework being available to common people so I can just upload my, you know, vital, uh, all the med, med uh, you know, the lab test and everything and get a recommendation? Five years, 10 years? So for like automated diagnoses or diagnosis support? Yes, yes. Yeah, so that, that's probably unfortunately a little ways out. Maybe it'll come faster by some luck of, or magic, but uh, we'll, we'll see how long that takes. I'm, I'm not gonna even guess a amount of time. Uh, in terms of like trying to upload the data and data acquisition, uh, that's becoming more real time. So you know there are ways now that we can acquire data directly from patients or study participants where you can upload that information. Um, but doing a true diagnostic approach, part of the issue that we always run into or you know, one, it's as a physician, we always like to do diagnoses ourselves. But how do you guarantee that all of the data is there? I mean, it's tough for us to do that, but how do you make sure that the algorithm has all of the data in a clean format? And we don't even interchange records well now between EHRs, no less between you know, machine yeah. learning models. You know, if, if, if it's not true diagnostic, at least like uh, the way of looking at like the overall kind of a view of a dashboard of what's really going on and stuff like that. So yeah, and y you know, some of that we do already. It's just a little bit more opaque to the end user. So physician support we do a lot of. So physician diagnostic uh, support, radiology support. Uh, even in our ICUs at uh, Yale now, we are doing uh, a lot of predictive analytics. Of we, can, we have some uh, score that we can watch and follow and track and it will actually predict whether you're at risk for being admitted to the ICU so that we can send a rapid response team nurses, physicians to go help the patient and try to improve them so that they don't have to move from a standard unit to the intensive care unit. And we've had some luck with that. So, you know, it's definitely starting to emerge and become more common in clinical care, uh, but we're not quite to any automated diagnosis yet. Uh, I'm curious about your interaction with SAS, trying to get stuff uh, done. Uh, I know that's a big challenge. Yeah, <laughs> I, I come from a retail background, but prior to that, I did a lot of quantitative genetics. Okay. And I use SAS um, and other Fortran programs. Now I'm just wondering, uh, uh, wh what's what's the problem? I mean, there are tools out there where you can, you know, run all kinds of models, you know, uh, like R and all. I mean, what, what, what is it? Just the perception, or do you s still have like a group of people? Uh, no older generation who use SAS and just don't want to move on. Yeah, so the research is dynamic. Yeah, so there's actually a couple of great graphs out there. So I, I've been trying to look into that as well because there is a great, a large following of SAS, particularly in pharma and biomedical research. 
Uh, part of the sense I get is that if you are trying to do a study for pharma and want to get FDA approval, they like to see some of these more supported tools that have some sort of validation done to them. Uh, I haven't looked into the details of how far down that goes or which validations have actually been done, uh, but that's the sense I've gotten from many of our statisticians. Integrating it is tough. I haven't had any luck with the Kerberize cluster. Actually, I didn't even have any luck with the non-Kerberize cluster. They've got a package. I tried installing it, and it just it doesn't it? do anything. It? What's that? Uh, no, everything's on-prem for us. So. Yeah, it's, I mean, there's, if, so if you Google like R and SAS or Python and SAS, they've got a lot of great graphs out there of what's the breakdown by industry and by age and all of the things you said were exactly the breakdown points. So I think we'll see likely more and more migration uh, away from it, uh, but we are trying to make sure that at least we can do at least some basic level of support for it since, you know, if there, there is definitely a push from partners in pharma and industry that we have requests of, you know, we want this in some form of SaaS as it comes over to them or gets de-identified and sent over. So it's something that we're dealing with, but personally, I've, I mean, I've used SaaS a couple of times. I know how to use it, but beyond that, everything for me is Python or R. So the traditional data warehouse, um, when you port that into your uh, Hadoop, right? Mm -hmm. So will you transpose that into the same star schema or will you transpose that into a different wide area? Uh, so we of? actually do a couple of different things. So one, we pull it in basically native and then depending on what we're going to do for downstream analysis, we've got it set up so that we can use basically Spark to remap as desired for other studies or to do things like de-identification. So if there's only certain columns we want to migrate over or do subsets of data. Uh, so while we have a single kind of golden data source, we do do a lot of data mapping so that it's in different formats that are most appropriate to the downstream analysis. Yeah, because I was thinking about the high cardinality point of view, how it is going to yeah. help the performance there. Yep. Okay. Great, well thank you all very much for uh, coming. If anybody has any other questions, feel free to come up and enjoy the rest of the conference.